All right, thank you, Michael, for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here this year. Thanks especially to the Small But Efficient uh, Scholars Program team, Maria, Paul, and Laura, and everybody else at SAR that's made this experience uh, very um, pleasant so far, and will continue to do, to do so, I'm sure. And thanks to all of you for showing up this early after what I imagine you, you had last night crazy Halloween parties. Um, <laughs> So today I'll be speaking about hacking, or what I call cold worlds and cold work across the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. My approach is ethnographic, and I'll go more into my methods in a second, but I'm interested in what I call manifestations of hacking. So what does hacking mean to people? How do they practice it? Ultimately, I'm interested in the emergence of the everyday hacker. So why does it seem that anybody can be a hacker? We should be hackers. I'm sort of going away from this negative connotation of the hacker. And I'll argue that it has something to do with the information technology economy, related entrepreneurial development, and also a new way of orienting toward the world. I'll show today how the underlying logics of software design get integrated into the way people think, rethink about their social and work lives. And I'll start by bringing you into one of these hackathon events. In the Colonia Nahuac neighborhood of Mexico City, dozens of young tech enthusiasts wait in line to be allowed admission to the 2015 Hack Ciudad Mexico event. Like other hackathons, this event proposes that participants show up, network, build a multidisciplinary team, and create a technological solution to a pressing societal problem. The winners in each category receive cash prizes and a promise from the city government to provide institutional support for the project to be successfully implemented. The event is sponsored by over 30 government entities. The long list of names takes up a substantial portion of their website. If the heavy government involvement is somehow lost on any of the participants, they're promptly reminded when a caravan of black Chevy Suburbans pulls up to the building. Several square-shaped gentlemen wearing suits, dark sunglasses, and earpieces jump out of one of the vehicles and form a pocket around the slimmer man wearing a nicer suit as they approach the entrance. They cut in line. Con esos lentes no pueden ver que hay una cola. With those glasses, they can't even see there's a line, one of the young men in line exclaims. Who is he, I ask. I don't know and I don't care, he responds. Waiting in line around the industrial building where the event will be hosted, a couple of young men spot an obscure door with a sign that reads, Tocar en la siguiente puerta. Or la cortina de la vuelta. One of them quickly gets out a Sharpie marker and makes two small modifications to change cortina, curtain, to cantina, bar. <laughs> Ahí está, el primer hack del día. There it is, the first hack of the day, he announces to an approving crowd. The attitudes and positions expressed in these brief interactions with these participants waiting to enter the hackathon define much of the spirit and tone that will make up the weekend event. These self-identified hackers exhibit a sensibility for modifying, tweaking, and finding ways to exploit vulnerabilities in systems and structures, from the text on the sign to the practices of the corrupt police officers. They embody and perform an ethos of hacking everything. In 48 hours, enthusiastic programmers, entrepreneurs, designers, and community members will have to pitch their idea to over 1,000 participants in attendance. So to give you an idea of how I'll move through the talk today, uh, my work is transnational. I, do, I went to these hackathon events in Mexico and here in the US, mostly in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we can talk more about ways to study the transnational if you have questions about that after the talk. But I'll start, I'll focus today on this hackathon in Mexico and my discussion we framed around the Mexican context. Um, so I'll start by giving some political economy in Mexico, how these hackathons and these co-working spaces fit into the overall uh, making of the nation or remaking of the nation from the state's perspective. Um, and I'll tease out this tension between the state-constructed hacker and the hacker who uh, believes he or she is making an intervention in these systems. Um, so I'll take you into the hackathon, explore some of what goes on in there, and ultimately, I want to show you how some of these underlying logics of software design get integrated into the way people think about the world, and I'll focus on one specifically called loose coupling. 
So first, I think we have to take a, a short break and say, what is hacking, right? Because I think this is going to be important for what we're trying to argue here. So I went around and just took some different images I found uh, uh, in magazines and thought about how the hacker is framed in contemporary media. So if you're familiar with this popular show, Mr. Robot, uh, it's the most current series that sort of takes on the hacker persona, right? So we still get the trope of the sort of hooded guy, uh, kind of a socially awkward genius that wants to intervene in, in a system. How does the series start out? He shows up to a cafe and exposes this man that runs a very large network that he's using to sponsor child pornography. So he shows up and tells him, you made it really hard to see, but I saw, right? So there's something about seeing something others can't, sort of opening up the black boxes of technology. And as he's leaving, he called the cops to come get this guy. The guy says, you know, I could have made you rich. I had a lot of money. And he says, I'm not interested in money. Right, so it's this sort of disassociation from uh, capitalistic or capital, capital, capital accumulation. Um, here from MIT Tech Review, you know, this man that tried to hack the biological clock. So a man from Davis that's doing do-it-yourself do gene therapy, trying to extend his life and sort of parallels a lot of the uh, fascination currently in Silicon Valley with extending your life, right? And here the more... Another manifestation of hacking, or the one I, more, I, I focus on more, uh, these young women were feeling it. Um, they spent a day hacking and came up with a prototype to um, translate printed text to Braille. So they came up, they came up with an app. Here we see Hack Holyoke, right? So a hackathon in the name of um, empowering women. This is labeled as a sort of first women's hackathon in a liberal arts colleges. So there's a lot of first in the hackathon world and what I want to get at here is about some sort of empowerment for different communities um, and if we don't know what a hackathon is it's usually uh, takes place over a weekend two to three days sometimes shorter amount of time people get together there's some overlying theme um, whether you're empowering a group whether you're hacking tech uh, health um, Hacking, what other sort of hackathons have we heard of? <laughs> Sorry? Right, so the hack Wikipedia, um, incorporating information to Wikipedia f f from a, a feminist perspective. There's art, art hack spaces and art hack events. Right, so in the art world, so, and, and it doesn't have to be uh, themed around technology, right? Anything else? Uh, there's something in Boston that's not called a slam. Is that the same? Hmm, I'm not sure. What, what is the slam? It's a computer. Uh, it's a computer. Okay, so it, it, different names, um, some sort of getting together, working on a problem. Goes over the weekend. Goes over the weekend. You come up with some prototype and you yeah. pitch it to diverse audiences, sometimes uh, investors, sometimes judges. You get some sort of prize at the end. So I'm interested in the genealogy of hacking, right? And I think people trace it uh, to different origins. Um, one self-identified hacker and cybersecurity blogger says, the word hacker started out in the 14th century to mean somebody who was inexperienced or unskilled in a particular activity, such as golf hackers. In the 70s, the word hacker was used by computer enthusiasts to refer to themselves. They ref this reflected the way enthusiasts approach computers. They shun formal education and play around, play around with the computer until they can get it to work. So how is it that in the 70s and 80s it was used to refer to a computer hacker, someone sort of playfully tinkering around with things? In the 2000s it becomes more of from te technological outlaw to terrorist, and now in the 2010s more of the sort of everyday hacker I'm interested in, right? Um, here we have these rules that a hacker school in Mexico came up with. So there's a hacker ethic and there's rules you have to follow to belong to this culture, right? So give before you get, don't ask for permission, uh, make before you speak, there's no excuses, resolve problems, follow your curiosity, failing equals growing, know your tools and communities, 
always continue to learn, get involved, and have fun in the process. So hacking can take on different dimensions, different definitions. I think in some general sense, we could think about different axes of, of, of defining it. Uh, repur repurposing technology for means other than what the technology was intended for. Playful tinkering, te technological or not. Uh, some sort of technical competency. Um, knowing some system, whether it's a code system or any system, so well that you know the sort of back entries, you know how it's constructed and can find ways into it uh, or ways to destroy it, right? Um, and most importantly, what I want to get from all of this is that it doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation that we all uh, tend to associate with it. So to give you a little bit of the theoretical framing or how I'm thinking about um, framing the research, so there's this line of work that investigates the sort of culture of Silicon Valley, right? So has anybody heard of Route 128? Yes. Okay, one person, a couple of people. And that's pretty, people usually don't know what Route 128 is. And I think Anno Saxinian's point is it's a sort of ring around uh, Massachusetts, Boston, Cambridge. And uh, the argument is why did Silicon Valley get so powerful and this other region, and left sort of this region in dust? Uh, they both had uh, important universities, they both had the technical infrastructure, um, they both had a, a startups, um, you know, e emerging on the scene. And Anno Saxinian's answer is culture, right? So in Silicon Valley, people sort of had jeans and T-shirts. They were more open. They were willing to share information. Um, so that's one line of work that wants to investigate this culture of Silicon Valley. Um, anthropology of hacking. So Biela Komen, who will give a public talk here in January. Chris Kelty, Anita Sei Chan spend times with these collectives who self-identify as hackers, and they come up with a couple of conclusions. There's some libertarian foundation to their interventions, so um, you know, free market, uh, but also open spaces that are not really open. They're, sort of, they're based on some sort of meritocracy, in this case, showing your technical competency. And the Hacker Manifesto sort of says, we're interested in your hacking, not in your race, culture, gender, nation. Um, all these other criteria are bogus criteria. But we've started to move in the direction, especially with Anita Sei Chan, of looking at sort of difference within the hacker community. I'm also thinking about embodied risk. So there's ethnographers that spend time, especially with people in the finance industry, uh, Wall Street bankers. Um, so what are the subjectivities that are involved in the creation of these uh, markets, right? And I think the ex ex uh, relevant example is Hirokazu Miyazaki, who does work with Japanese investment bankers, and he, give this, he gives this anecdote where there's a banker, and he's using the sort, an Excel sheet with the sort of logics um, he uses to think about the market to decide how to make friends with people, right? Like, how much time do I have, and who should I sort of make a connection with? So how does the sort of overall uh, finance economy influence the way you think about the world. And then I'm also trying to be in conversation with uh, scholars from Mexico, right? So I don't want to s sort of just be speaking about these things from a U.S. perspective. And there's scholars that look at sort of disenchanted youth in Mexico and how people are sort of fed up with political economy. And we could see in this picture, you know, these young people saying, Chapo, hazme un hijo. So Chapo, make me a baby, right? Like you want to sort of exist outside of the system. Methodologically, okay, so the, to investigate these things empirically, um, I ask how do hacker entrepreneurs, people that navigate between the hacker worlds, the entrepreneur worlds, make small reinventions to establish protocols, technical and entrepreneurial. Um, and specifically in this talk, I look at how the coding logics are incorporated into strategies for reorganizing the social world. Methodologically, between 2013 and 2016, I spent time at in, mostly in these events and also these co-working spaces. In Mexico, it happened in two cities, in Mexico City and Jalapa. Um, I have a CS degree in computer science, so I was able so, to sort of perform my role as technological mentor in these spaces. And I interviewed folks uh, while we were working on these different applications. And also, while I was using a methodology I call qualitative networking metadata analysis, it sounds pretty fancy. I'll show you what it is at the end of the talk.
So now I want to bring you back to the hackathon ritual in Mexico to show you how research participants fill the space with critique, meaning, and hope. Among the projects that will be, de will be developed at the event are Infracción, an app that allows users to quickly verify if a traffic agent is officially registered to give you a citation. Ese Taxi, an app that helps users feel safe when using public taxi taxis by sharing routes with close acquaintances. And Aguas Way, a platform that allows you to check potable water conditions in your area. Last year, Chavita's app, Audivio, won second prize in the competition. It used a crowdsourcing platform to help find missing persons in the city. Despite the city's promise to help fund and support the project, nothing materialized from Aldivio other than a congratulatory letter signed by a city official and some winning pictures and press. Infracción, Ese Taxi, and Aguas Way are doomed the same fate. This isn't particular to this hackathon or even to Mexico. Lily Irani chronicles a similar experience at a Delhi hackathon in India. Years go by without her demo spawning any projects, grants, or working software systems, despite the fact that a team of talented professionals spent weeks putting in the code work to create a sophisticated working demo. Many hackathons have similar endings where participants just shake hands and say goodbye, and where much of what gets built never really gets built at all. Chavita, as well as other hackathon participants, are well aware of these dynamics. I asked Chavita why he showed up again this year in the face of the same empty promises, and he responded with a reserved shrug. This is one of the guiding questions into this line of inquiry. I want to know, why do these self-identified hackers continue to help stage the hackathon in a setting where promises of rewards and opportunities are largely spectacle? To investigate this question, I first want to give you some relevant background on the political economy of Mexico. In Mexico, tech startup scene has surfaced with California Silicon Valley in mind as a prototypical model for innovation and disruption. It has, always, it, it has also emerged in parallel to hype from economic analysts who project Mexico is set to emerge as the Aztec tiger economy. President Peña Nieto's administration quickly orchestrated an ambitious reform agenda addressing labor laws which granted foreign corporations greater freedom to hire and fire Mexicans at low wages, enab enabling maquiladoras to once again set up shop. Economic analysts claim Peña Nieto has effectively helped change Mexico's image from, free from drug war zone to free trade poster child. Mexico has more free trade agreements than any country in Latin America. Peña Nieto's reforms follow de devel developmentalist logic aim to move Mexico beyond low-wage factory jobs and toward an entrepreneurial economy. Journalistic accounts claim Mexico is producing graduates in engineering and technology at rates that challenge international rivals. University enrollment in general has tripled in 30 years to almost 3 million students who want to join Mexico's purported growing middle class. According to Marcos, the co-founder of the first tech startup incubator in Mexico City, the self-motivated and self-governing hackers and freelance software developers are part of a new generation of young people who have undergone a complete cultural overhaul. Five years ago, they would graduate and think about getting a job. Today, more than half of them want to start their own business, he says. He mentions, vent he mentions venture capital investments in Mexico surged to $978 million in the first half of 2015, more than double of the $400 million reported in the first half of 2014. He uses numbers to back up his claim and tells us the startup boom is not only working in Mexico because of this investment, but he also credits Mexicans' creativity for being able to stay ahead of the exploding startup culture. Thus, the hackathon and the hacker are at the center of not only the imaginary of the nation, but also the coding and operation. Sorry. Not only the imaginary of the nation, but the coding and operation of the new economies that compete to be the next Silicon Valley, or other offshoot terms that index rapid economic development defined by technical expertise and information technologies. So there's Silicon Alley, Silicon Valle, Valle Silicon Savannah. Has, have people heard of any other Silicons? Where is that? Is that here? Okay. Silicon Mesa, okay. <laughs> Following these developmentalist agendas, hackathons and co-working spaces fit into the larger Mexican political economic landscape as spaces to keep these recent graduates busy, as potential generators of companies that will create jobs for them and their colleagues, 
and as a type of infrastructure that will help Mexico emerge on the global innovation stage. Not surprisingly, state government offices can be found on the first floor of iLab, one of the spaces where I conducted research. Politicians frequently drop by to hear the latest startup pitches and take pictures with the teams. The young entrepreneurs by no means ignore the political backing and presence. Alberto Chung, a self-identified hacker from Jalapa, comments on the upcoming hackathon being sponsored by the city government. Don't ask how I got a draft of the call for this Jalapa hackathon, but if you want to participate, you can start getting ready. We have to develop technological solutions to resolve mobility problems and municipal services. And according to this announcement, whether or not you win, you have to submit your project, code, and documentation. And well, the prize is that you appear in Jalapa's newspaper, you get a scholarship to iLab, and you get a pat on the back from the municipal president. Very tempting, right? Especially in relation to hackathons, interlocutors across my sites were in agreement that government entities were using them as a way to further their own political agendas and as photo shoot opportunities for their poster politicians. The connection between entrepreneurial subject making and neoliberal nation making is not specific to Mexico. Entrepreneurs are frequently championed as, championed as drivers of forward thinking, large scale social change. These projects cast entrepreneurs as collaborative rather than agnostic, technical rather than political, and as collaborative, constructive rather than complaining. This model entrepreneurial hacker thus emerges as an ideal subject in this Mexican landscape, where the majority of young people exist completely disconnected from institutional support needed to provide for their health, work, education, and security. If the Mexican state is invested materially and imaginatively in the hackathon, so are the participants that come to put in the code work to attempt to make their solutions, hesitancies, and dreams come alive. Among the cast of characters at this hackathon, we'll find iLab's director, El Pato. This is in response, this is what the students have nicknamed him in response to his characteristic phrase, Yo escopeta, tu pato. I'm the shotgun, you're the duck. The phrase is meant to index an overall disciplining of the rising hacker entrepreneurs who join iLab. El Pato's Bible is the Lean Startup, a popular book that circulates widely in the startup world and proposes a decentralized protocol for efficiently developing tech products that meet the needs of early customers, thereby reducing market risk and sidestepping large amounts of initial project funding. In an interview, El Pato tells me, lean means slim, but it also means we're always in beta. Nothing is certain. If we see something that's not being applied correctly, we calibrate it. If we see there's a process being applied successfully in another location, we adopt it and connect it to ours. We don't want to be static, we want to be very dynamic. When he makes appearances at events like the hackathon, he supervises iLabbers to make sure they're adhering to this disciplined entrepreneurship. Hugo, a recent UNAM computer science graduate, travels over two hours on public transportation in and out of Mexico City from a peripheral municipio to participate in these events and to freelance with small businesses. Most of his earnings he contributes to help pay for his family expenses and he saves up just enough to purchase airplane tickets to attend popular tech events in San Francisco. Wearing t-shirts given, given away by these companies is a badge of honor for the hacker. Some of Hugo's favorites are talk is cheap, show me the code, and his absolute favorite, programming is the closest things we have to superpowers. So I want to say thank you to my partner wife, Daniela, who came up with these uh, avatars. Um, out of respect for people at the hackathon, uh, we came up with these depictions and changed their names. Out of respect for people who weren't there, I'm going to tell the rest exactly the way it happened. And if any of these are, um, resemble me in any way, it's purely coincidental. Programming is the closest thing we have to superpowers, a favorite at DevF, the first hacker school in Latin America. Created in 2014, it's nomadic, in that each batch of students takes part in the eight-week program in a different part of Mexico City, many times within other co-working spaces. Like many of the young men and few women that come to the school, and gender is not necessarily part of this analysis, although we can talk about the construction of gender and masculinity in these spaces. Um, in the Q&A session. 
The founders of DBF, Kike and Eme, felt their university material was outdated and their researchers, their teachers lacked passion. We love to go to the hackathon so much, we made one that would extend more in time. We wanted to live the hackathon every day, Eme tells me. One of Eme's first entries on his popular and widely circulated blog lays out the 10 principles of the hacker ethic I showed you in the beginning. This hacker culture thus becomes a product to be sold to hackers in the making by expert sensei teachers. The language used in the hacker ethic aligns with the discourse Mexican scholars have pinpointed as neoliberal discourses about taking initiative, being self-satisfied, not waiting for government. The co-modification of this hacking might be seen as positive in the sense that young men, especially if they come from underprivileged backgrounds, build solidarity with other young men, learn new skills that might enable them to gain employment, and at the very least, hacking keeps them away from urban crime, especially while they hack away inside the sanitized co-working space. In the past, the program was priced on a sliding scale, and you didn't have to be officially registered in DVF to participate. But in 2016, the business model was calibrated, another term from Silicon Valley, right? To target those who could pay 25,000 pesos to receive official endorsement from the program. Once DVF is economically sustainable, they'll once again open up the doors to everyone, Kike assures me. The good thing is Hugo, Chavita, and their sensei friends always have the doors of the hackathon open. They join El Pato and the rest of the cast and spend the weekend together thinking about Mexico's problems at the same time that they meet and work with other hackers, designers, entrepreneurs, and curious onlookers from across the country. Participants that have shown up to take part in the spectacle of the hackathon. More importantly, hackers have gathered not only to create something new, but to share in person their latest creations. They show off their code to others who can appreciate it. Look at all these import files, Chavita tells Hugo, as he points to dozens of import statements in his Python file. So if you're not familiar with code, an import statement basically tells this snippet of code to look at a library where other functions are defined so that you don't have to re-implement them in this particular section. And if you don't understand it, that's completely fine. I don't have more than 40 lines in each class, Chavita further explains. Hugo, who hasn't slept in the last 30 hours, manages to follow Chavita's demonstration with his bloodshot eyes and confirms Chavita's accomplishments with an enthusiastic, it is un chingon, you're a badass, he tells him. Indeed, the principles of reuse, simplicity, consistency, efficiency, and the ability to shuttle between different lay layers of abstraction are core tenets of computer science and metrics used to identify a talented computer programmer. Event participants use the time and space to share code from other projects they've been working on, sometimes from their professional jobs where there's few programmers and where results-oriented managers fail to recognize the complexity and beauty of their creations. Hackers value cleverness, ingenuity, and wit. If one can dissect, manipulate, reassemble, and solve the problem within the given constraints and the tools at hand, one can create beautiful, original code. Within the space of the hackathon, Chavito, Hugo, and other hackers come together for a weekend to look for this coding bliss. So one thing I would do in my research is ask the software developers, show me a piece of code you're particularly proud of, just to see what they would show me, how they would talk about it. Hugo further explains the code behind his Identicon project. So what this code does is create these pixelated avatars. Um, if you've ever been in some sort of so social network and you don't put up your picture, you might get one of these guys. And this is the code that creates that avatar. I really like this code because it helps you understand the necessary procedures using the functional language Elixir. And don't worry if you don't get into the sort of coding bliss that they get into. It's okay, I didn't either. Maybe I was putting in too much anthropology work in the last 10 years, not enough code work to sort of get into it. 
Uh, but I want, what I want to show here is that Ugo wasn't so concerned with the efficiency and simplicity of the code. He was more concerned about making it legible to people who might not be computer programmers. And this is something that interests me. What are the sort of design decisions people make in, the, in writing this code that don't necessarily align with the core tenets of computer science, right? Ugo works for a tech consulting firm. Ugo works for a small consult tech consulting firm in Mexico City and usually spends 10 to 12 hours a day programming and many times has to work weekends with no extra pay since he gets paid by the project. He's aware of the exploitation, but instead of framing it as a situation where he has no other choice, he refers to his arrangement as loose coupling. Loose coupling is a computing term that refers to a robust way to write code where data structures or other components can use other components in an interconnected system without needing to know the full details of their implementation. In this way, each component becomes more autonomous and can be used for different purposes by different components. Elements become coupled and depend on each other with very little or no direct knowledge of each other. Ugo goes on to recommend manuals and tutorials that further explain the software design so that I can value its complexity and its value, appreciate its value. The term loose coupling Ugo uses to refer to his flexible work arrangement references his autonomy at the same time that it references his replaceability. Like many of the young people in attendance, Ugo contracts out his skills to diverse companies and startups. Ugo further elaborates on these hackathon dynamics. Antes los políticos llegaban a repartir licuadoras y a tomarse la foto cuando se terminaba una cancha de básquet, si es que se terminaba. Ahora llegan a repartir stickers del hackathon y a tomarse fotos con los equipos ganadores. In the past, the politicians would arrive to distribute blenders and take pictures with basketball courts when they were completed. So politicians would come, create the project in these small towns, and sort of come take pictures once they were completed, if it was ever completed. Now they arrive to distribute hackathon stickers and take pictures with the winning teams. Ugo's referring to the swag that's handed out at these events. Stickers are, these stickers are primarily used as marketing material. They show the logos of tech companies, operating systems, development tools, and hackathon events. Participants like to decorate their laptops, creating colorful, creative displays. Even though Ugo criticized the practice of sticker distribution, associating it with the old method of gifting household electronics, such as blenders, in the name of voter recruitment by politicians, he still proudly displays his stickers. Moreover, the varied events, companies, and technological platforms show the contradictory and fleeting allegiances that currently make up his hacker world. Like the loose coupling approach he takes to code, the hacker arrangements, the sticker arrangements, point to his flexible and legible networking capabilities. After several iterations of the prototypes, testing and debugging, the participants commit their final code snippets to the team's repository, click deploy, and celebrate the successful launch of their working application. They deliver a phenomenal pitch to hundreds who show up for their final demo session, and their app wins the first prize in the solutions for the city category. The team poses proudly for their group photograph. Chavita gets the same certificate he did last year. In his individual photo session, a different politician than last year takes a picture with him. So again, a half-naked woman is uh, you know, behind them as they work. Constructions of masculinity and gender are always a part of these spaces. After the hackathon, Hugo, Chavita, and other winners reintegrate into everyday life. This means going to the university, helping out at home with brothers and sisters, and the most fun aspect of their everyday lives, going to DBF to continue to hack. This time, they're in a co-working space named The Pool in an upscale, na upscale neighborhood of Polanco. Hackers in training meet their friends and set up their laptops to hack in the perfectly kept space which adds touches of inspiration with quotes written on the wall. The only way to win is to learn faster than everyone else, it says in English over the main workspace where the black belts work. But they won't be here long. Remember, DVF is nomadic. 
Each batch of students goes through the program in a different part of Mexico City, many times within co-working spaces, sometimes within large tech companies. The logic here is that within these tech companies' facilities, they might get involved in the operations of the company, but not necessarily, and they promote their hacker students for the advertised jobs within the company. If they do get a job, it's crucial that they don't sacrifice their hacker ethic. Thus, their interactions with the different companies might effectively resemble loose coupling. In contemporary Mexico, multitudes of citizens collectively protest the impunity, corruption, and violence that have come to characterize state practices, where narcofosas, drug trade graves, with hundreds of unclaimed bodies, frequently appear in clandestine locations, where dozens of protesting students go missing in the hand of state officials, where nothing seems to work. Something in the here and now at Hack Ciudad Mexico and DVF at iLab works for the hackers. With these examples, I'm arguing hackers in Mexico immerse themselves in this coding bliss, navigating the politics of making and not making at the same time that they make different ways to see the world, to reimagine relationships, programs, and remake programs into social systems. Hacker ethics and software design logics, such as loose coupling, give them a heuristic and an analytic for thinking about ways to reorganize their social relations. Hacking is characterized by reinvention, playfulness, and resistance. They use, they use these coding logics to think about their relationships with entities who produce value from their hacking at the same time that they attempt to rearrange them, or at least take control of, the worlds, of these worlds with ever-shifting, flexible arrangements. Their code work reconfigures market logics of agility, competitiveness, and risk to creatively combine them with logics of reinvention, playfulness, and resistance. So in this one, almost last slide, I want to bring you into sort of what I'm working on now, some of the future directions of this research. And remember, my work is transnational, so how am I thinking about borders in this work, and how am I thinking about elements of exclusion? So one thing I did, uh, remember the metadata analysis that sounded fancy? Um, this is a tool called Immersion, I-M-M-E-R-S-I-O-N. It's a tool created in the MIT Media Lab. What it does is it takes your email client's metadata, so to, from, cc, and it creates graphs of, of your social networks. So who have you emailed in this amount of time? You can move this slider and it shows you how your networks are changing. And of course you might say, well, people I'm close to, I don't necessarily email, I text them, I call them, I'm on a Slack channel with them. But it's not necessarily an objective way to think about the network. I'm thinking about it more qualitatively. Um, as people are sort of thinking about their networks and seeing why is this particular person not in my network anymore, I ask them things like, why aren't they there anymore? Why don't you talk to this person? Who is this new cluster of relationships and why are you making these connections? So I think it's one way to approach the more transnational circuits of uh, experts, transnational circuits of software developers, and also the different groups that emerge within these networks in the name of empowering a Latino collective, in the name of empowering women, in the name of empowering different groups. So it's one step toward um, highlighting these networks across borders. It's also a nice way if we think about ethnography and computer science. So when I would show this to software developers, they'll start sort of telling me about the user interface and ways to uh, make it better. Right? And I didn't make the thing, so I, I, I take all of their criticism, but it's also sort of reflexive, a, a chance to reflect on my methodologies. And I ask them, well, how, can you, how do you think I can improve my methodology to get at some of these underlying logics? So it's a point where there's, a, there's conversation between this the ethnographer, uh, researcher, and the person, um, the people we're trying to conduct research with. When I initially asked Chavita why he continued to attend hackathons in the face of empty promises and uncertain outcomes, he responded with a reserved shrug. By following his and other hacker moves within and outside of the hackathon in other spaces, it becomes clear that young people learn to function inside of a challenged neoliberal economy 
by using different resources, appropriating the discourses of flexibility and self-management while they remain outside of formal routine employment, and at the same time, they maintain their bliss for hacking to rate themselves and to form a community where others can truly value their code work. As they negotiate their new subject positions and conditions, Mexican hackers create a collectivist response of alternative meaning making and code making to fill an overarching neoliberal program with substance, meaning, and materi materiality. For young people who attend these events, hacking emerges as a way to make sense of their futures in a precarious state and economy, as a way to exist in a system where things just don't seem to work, and as a way to let their code work intervene in narratives that have only delivered false hopes. I've brought you into the world of hackathons and co-working spaces to show you how Chavita, Hugo, and the hackers and senseis at DevEfe actively participate and thoroughly enjoy themselves while they appropriate and embody the hacker spirit and ethic. That is, in some ways they belong to this undifferentiated global hacker community other scholars have conducted research with. They value cleverness, creativity, and place a high premium on knowledge, self-cultivation, and self-expression as core tenets to achieving the productive freedom and corresponding software freedom. They improve their technical craft by following principles of reuse, simplicity, consistency, efficiency, manipulation, and agility. Hackers attend these events and hone their skills as they work in solidarity to find this coding bliss, the effective dimension one encounters when creating beautiful code. The emergence of the hacker subject position in Mexico also satisfies other interested entities. For government, hackathons provide the opportunity to showcase the promise of technology to its citizens and to show the talent that awaits potential international investors. Co-working spaces, hackathons, entrepreneurial initiatives, and neoliberal reforms are, are seldom differentiated by politicians. Hacker entrepreneurs become part of a reimagining of Mexico as an orchestrated national project. For Silicon Valley, California, and the US, the exportation of the hacker results in economic and cultural capital. Hackers in Mexico not only translate and modify these ethics, they also use products from US companies that help them become hackers. In the last decade, this tech startup boom has manifested itself across the globe in the form of tech hub spaces, tech accelerators and incubators, co-working spaces, startup weekends, and demo days where young entrepreneurs pitch their ideas to panels of judges and potential investors. Out of this movement, hacking has emerged as a way to be in the world, but also as a way to relate to institutions. The everyday hacker has emerged. Definitions of a hacking range, as I showed you, from repurposing technologies for unintended consequences, to the use of technology to advance some sort of social good, to removing a stain from your t-shirt, as resident scholar Thomas Swenson pointed out last week. Among Mexican hackers, I found a heterogeneous cast of characters, motivations, and experiences not just driven by an interest in exhibiting the entrepreneurial spirit in order to perform middle-classness. When research participants search for this coding bliss, they carve out ephemeral, unstable, and shifting spaces within these spaces, momentary oases where something works in a vast desert where, at the moment, nothing else seems to work. Hacking becomes one way to confront the state or to construct a state with a sense of autonomy while the state constructs itself alongside the hackers. Blissfully immersed in the coding logics that underline these programming approaches, they learn to design systems that promote separation of concerns and self-determination by actors. That is, the components in a loosely coupled system are less con constrained by their platform, whether it's an el element in a coding environment or an actor in a political environment. In my research, I've attempted to tease out this main tension between, between the state-constructed hacker and the hacker who constructs his or her intervention. I've also taken seriously other anthropologists' calls to examine on the ground the possibility for hacking to construct new subjectivities or meaningful technical and political forms. Mexican hackers demonstrate agility at performing this global hacker status at the same time that they perform their Mexican hacker roles. That is, they dem demonstrate intimate knowledge of Mexican institutions and hone their ability to manage themselves and their loose coupling as they use their making to serve a productive purpose, one in which they highlight and renegotiate their relationship with state, private companies, and their valued hacker communities. 
as young people turn the spotlight less on what they say and more on what they code. And in the context in which they do so, they hack away, and in the background we have business as usual, politics as usual, reforms as usual. Politicians create and recreate the state in response to narratives from historians and social scientists who paint Mexico as hyper-conscious of its backward condition for at least 150 years, or as a place where traditions have not yet disappeared and modernity has not completely arrived. The hackathon becomes a site where new versions of modernity are staged, where the state and the hackers find complex ways to co-produce themselves, and where coding logics become foundational for this reorganizing of the social world and of social relations. Here, the self-identified hackers find meaning in a community of action and performance, a community that supports them as they negotiate their new subject positions and conditions within these overarching processes that always construct them as in the making, as always becoming, as always waiting. If they're going to be waiting, they might as well be waiting in line at the hackathon. Thank you.